Eugene Robinson already had quite a story. A walk-on in college and undrafted out of Colgate University, Robinson had played more than a decade with the Seahawks and had a pair of Pro Bowls on his resume, all before arriving in Green Bay via trade prior to the 1996 season. With the Packers, his story got its best chapters. What was your reaction when you were traded to the Green Bay Packers? So the first person to tell me about being traded was actually Reggie White. He called me up and said, Yo, Gino, you want to come to Green Bay? You want to come to Green Bay? I'm like, dude, I, what do you mean come to Green Bay? I'm still in the contract with Seattle. He said, man, you need to come to Green Bay. And lo and behold, maybe three weeks later, <laughs> I find myself in Green Bay. Uh, and so I, I kind of... Almost a premonition, Reggie White told me about being traded uh, before it was actually traded to Green Bay. And I thought, all right, let's let see what, you know, Green Bay's up and coming. They were just in the playoffs last year. Yeah, let's let's do this whole thing. And yeah. so, you know, it was my only option, and I loved it. Yeah. So you and Santana Dotson were a couple of key starters that joined the defense in 96. A lot of the thought was you guys could be the missing pieces to put the team over the top. Did you feel a lot of pressure when you arrived, or did you kind of enjoy all the hype that went along with it? No, I didn't feel a pressure. I, I remember grabbing the secondary together when I, when I got here because I knew that, I mean, I'm an older guy, of course, and, and I talked to him about, like, interceptions and getting interceptions. And I remember uh, your boy um, uh, Doug Evans said, hey, man, I had 29 knockdowns. I said, man, you know what that means? He said, what? I said, it means you can't catch. <laughs> He said, what do you mean? I said, it means you can't catch Doug. If you call half of them, you'll lead the league. I said, we're going to change that narrative, man. So let's just catch the ball. And so I was kind of like, you know, just infusing myself into the culture and into the lore of all Green Bay and see how I could fit and how I can make my part, whatever part I'm going to have, how I can make that better and how I can add to what uh, Green Bay is already doing. Yeah. That 96 defense Beast. Led, led the league in points allowed. What made you guys so tough to score on? Our front, our defensive front was no joke. I mean, you said there was Sean Jones, Satana Dotson, Gilbert Brown, Reggie White. They got after you. And a guy who doesn't get a lot of credit is Brian Williams. B-Dub, could, he was one of your – He's, what, he's that linebacker who needs to be really fast and needs to be extremely powerful, has to play like safety, and he was one of those guys. And no one knew how good he was. Yeah. I was like, man, this dude is extremely good. And Bernardo Harris was in the middle. We just had some guys. Our front was just powerful, and they got after it. And, you know, uh, the late Fritz Shermer, he would dial up a lot of blitzes and a lot of things to go ahead and utilize that front scheme to go ahead and get out the people, and we did. And then we became recipient of the interceptions because of all the, all the, you know, the pressure the front was putting on. Yeah, you mentioned the interceptions. You had, if my stats are right, you had four interceptions in your first seven games with the Packers. Yeah. Nothing like making a strong first impression, <laughs> no? I mean. Yeah, I, what, one thing I've always been able to do um, is get interceptions, and it's, it's really by, you gotta study. You gotta make sure that you're watching the tone and tilt of the quarterback's shoulders. You gotta know the one, three, five, seven, seven drop. You gotta know when, if it's motion, if it's bootleg, if it's waggle. All these different things you have to know, and when you identify it, now I don't care how fast you are, it puts yourself in position, because academically you've gotten in the position where you can affect change. And I've always been able to do that by studying the academics of football. and. Doing that, it allows you just to be an athlete. Now I can be an athlete and get interceptions, and I was able to do that, Mike, for, for, for a long time. What made you and Leroy Butler such a good pair in the back end? Uh, Leroy is one of the best blitzing safeties I've ever met. Uh, Leroy is extremely fast, a little bit unorthodox in how he approaches things, and uh, because he has that kind of funky style, you, he can play linebacker, he can play safety, he can play corner. You get to use him as a, a pawn and a, and a chess piece, and so you get to move him around. I knew that going in. And so I know that I have to be a little bit more, okay, Lori, if you're going to be doing this, I need you to do this over here because somebody has to be able to do that. We both can't do it. And so really catering to Lori, or Leroy's talent. And Leroy is one of the most talented individuals I've ever met, so we catered to his talent. And then I played off of what he was doing a lot a lot of times, and then I would tell him what to do, what, what calls and signals and whatnot, because he really didn't want to do that stuff. Yeah. So what was it like after 12 years in the league to finally win it all? 
The big pinnacle for every football player is that you toil sometimes in obscurity and anonymity and, and, and you know, everybody knows the super duper stars, but all the hard work that you put in and the foundation that you laid and all the stuff that you do, that, you do, that when you win a Super Bowl, it kind of puts a big stamp on it and say, man, yeah, it validates your career, if you will. It, it really does, and it says that you were one of the best among the best in that year, or among the best in, in the history of football. And so having that stamp, having that validation as a free agent out of Colgate University who was a walk-on, who was undrafted guy, it said, oh my goodness, I belong. And so from that standpoint, a personal standpoint, for me and my wife and my family, it was, it was a great honor to have that validation and stamp. Robinson wasn't done. He helped the Packers get to another Super Bowl the following year. That one didn't end in glorious fashion, however. You were a part of two postseason runs with the Packers, 96 and 97. You actually had four interceptions in playoff games, which is the second most all time in the in the playoff record books for Green Bay. Is there any one of those big postseason interceptions that you remember the most? Yeah, so uh, I remember we we're in the second year, so that 97 going to the Super Bowl, we were playing a championship game down in San Fran. Right. And Fritz Sherman called a blitz. And Leroy was going to be running this blitz. I'm going to be covering Brent Jones on this play. And I'm like, and it was just after the play that I think we had just fumbled uh, with maybe um, – one of the receivers had just fumbled. And so it looked like the tide was going to turn. And Fritz Sherman dialed up a blitz that was going to involve Leroy. And I'm like, okay, but Steve Young probably is going to go to Brent Jones. If I could make good contact with Brent Jones, stay inside Brent Jones, I probably could steal one. I could see Leroy rushing. Brent comes off. He runs a little dig route deep in, about 15-yard in route. And as soon as he does, I'm like, oh, I hook him. And I'm like, I bet you. Steve Young is going to throw the ball. As soon as I said that, the ball was <laughs> right there. I'm like, oh, this is going to change the game. Caught the ball, hit off the sideline. We were in mud a little bit, so I kind of slipped up in the mud a little bit. But the ensuing play after that, we scored a touchdown with Antonio Freeman that changed the entire, entire narrative. San Francisco 49ers thought they were going to win that game. And it, it changed on that very one play. And it was everybody involved, not myself, but everybody involved. And I can remember Leroy Butler blitzing. Yeah. Now you were involved, I know the Packers lost the second Super Bowl you went to, but you were involved in a crazy sequence there. I believe it was late third quarter. The Broncos score, they take the lead. Antonio Freeman fumbles the kickoff. And on the first play, yeah. Elway goes for the kill shot. I mean, he's trying to knock you guys out right there. Yeah. You intercept him in the end zone, keep your team in the game. Just take me through that. That was that was kind of crazy. I so mean, that we, whole sequence. It was almost reminiscent of that the playoff game before that in the championship game and all the actors involved. We run the exact same office that San Francisco runs. And we run the exact same thing when it comes down to the red zone. They run a thing called Dino Y7, a sprint right option. This was a Dino Y7. You have a, a guy running through the post. McCaffrey's going to run through the post. Smith is going to go ahead and run a Dino, which is post, corner, post. And then they're going to tie up the, uh, the backside corner with a seven out of the backside. We run that play all the time. I said, as they lined up, I said, there's no way they're about to run a shake or Dino. They, there's only two routes they could run based on what they were doing. And soon as, as soon as they started to play, in the position, I saw McCaffrey trying to take me out of it, and I, I looked at John Elway, and John Elway was looking to the other side of the field. I said, John Elway's throwing that Dino. I turned around immediately, and I said to myself, turn, go back to the other side, because the ball's going to be in the air. As soon as I said that, and I turned, the ball was right here in front of me, and then I picked it off, and then I ran it back about 25 yards or whatever it was. But we were in the exact same route. I've seen that route a thousand times by Brett Favre in practice. So it was no, it didn't surprise me that they were going to run a Dino Y7. You talked about the validation of winning a Super Bowl. You had two cracks at winning a second one with the Packers and then the following year with the Falcons. How much did it sting to not get that second one when you had those chances? We had, I think the biggest one that stung, it was... The one we played in San Diego, I think we were San Diego. Right? Yeah. The, so the next Super Bowl, we had everything riding high, and we came in in that game with a, with some injuries too. Sean Jones was injured. No, Sean Jones was gone. Uh, Gabe Wilkins. Yeah, Wilkins. Wilkins he left got the hurt. game. I think he got hurt like the very first 
play. Yeah. So we had to go with uh, maybe Darius Holland. Yeah. Who plays a he plays a, a a one and a three technique. He's not a five technique guy, but we had to put him on a on a defensive end. And I could just remember nothing but zone stretch plays all day long by um, the Denver Broncos, and it became so intolerable because we didn't have the guy at the defensive end who was accustomed to playing the zone stretch. Yeah. And so he would jump in different gaps and those things, and it was it was driving me crazy. I'm going, just stay in one gap, just please, just stay in one gap, just one gap. So you can tell I remember a lot about yeah. that game yeah. because that game was probably the most pivotal and probably the one that I thought we should have won back to back. But it didn't materialize. Credit to uh, Denver Broncos. I get it. That's how football, that's how the ball bounces. Yeah. Last one for you. What will you remember the most about your time in Green Bay? The people. I can't. Now, I, this is an amazing place. Well, two things. The players, that locker room, how fun it was. I mean, awesome people. You know, I don't care about football. I care about the people in the locker room. And then just the fans. This is the most rabid, rabid, crazy place on earth that loves their team. I mean, diehard that loves their team, and they show it every single day. I mean, so from that, people would ask me about, hey, what's one of the favorite places you play? I said, man, Green Bay. Man, the Panthers are crazy, man. I've never played in a place where you are so much appreciated, whether you are a special teams guy, whether you're the star, or whether you this guy who got cut, came back, got cut, and they, they still know you. And I think that's kind of a unique thing here that's only kind of, um, you know, kind of germane to being here in, in Green Bay. And those are the things that I remember. Those are the things that kind of really catch my mind. And not so much the games and all that stuff, but just the people. 